Today we're going to be begin building sort of the aggregate demand aggregate supply model, which you're familiar with from your intro course. Uh, we're going to enrich it and make it more formal. What making it more formal means is doing it more with algebra and less with graphs. Why do we do it more with algebra and less with graphs? Primarily because we eventually want to take our theory and then test it against some data. And it's hard to throw data at a graph. You can throw it into an equation and run a statistical regression to see how well your theory fits the data. So we have to put it into algebra. It's a hassle though, because there's a lot of moving parts. And we want to try to keep them all straight. So we begin by thinking about the circular flow economy which you all might be familiar with. And the idea is that there are households in the world and there are firms in the world. Are there any other entities that we might want to consider here? We're going to include the government as another entity that gets involved. Typically we say that households sell resources to firms. What kinds of resources do houses, households own such that they're selling them to firms? Yeah. Labor. Labor primarily, but also we're going to treat land and capital as all being owned by households. After all, in the stock market, People own shares of stocks. They are the households that own the stocks of the firms that are investments into those <coughs> firms. So all ownership ultimately falls into households. Firms are just sort of this black box within which we transform resources into products, final goods, and services that are sold, again in turn, to households. So the selling of stuff goes this way, or so the selling of resources goes this way, the selling of stuff goes this way. In the meantime, the money is flowing the opposite direction. Households pay for goods and services and buy them from firms, and firms buy and send the money to the households like this. The payment, we call this a payment for goods and services flows from firms to households. Households consume goods and services. The firm captures revenues from consumers. And households collect income from firms. The payment is transformed into income and goes here. Again, income is wages with respect to labor. It is rent with respect to land. It is interest with respect to capital. <clears throat> so we have two major markets so far. We have this market where the factors of production are being sold by households and purchased by firms. We have the goods and services market. And then there is one other market, the vulnerable funds market. Now, households We'll take some of their income and put it into the loanable funds market. 
this is savings. Those loanable funds go through the goods and services market as investment that eventually get flows to firms. The government, in the meantime, also interacts in the loanable funds market by, by selling bonds. And the government also interacts with the goods and services market by purchasing uh, goods and services. So what we have are three major entities. I really think that there ought to be another entity here that is basically you know, financial services providers. We're just sort of putting them into an even bigger black box in a way to simplify things. But three major markets, the factor market, the vulnerable funds market, the goods and services market. And the models that we're going to build are models of each of those three markets. Because they're different markets, the labels that we put on the axes for those graphs will be different. In a local funds market, we'll have an interest rate. In the goods and services market, we'll have a price. And in the factor market, we can either talk about wages, rent, or interest. So then in building our aggregate demand, aggregate supply model, we start with the supply side. And again, in the supply side, this has to do with the factors of production. And we look at capital, which we usually signify with K. Labor, and there's also the inputs of land, and what I didn't include down there is entrepreneurial talent. Entrepreneurial talent gets neglected, I think, through most of macro. <laughs> it's unfortunate. Because the entrepreneur is that entity that bears the risk of profit and loss. The entrepreneur is also responsible for choosing the mix of other inputs into production and for the development of new technology that essentially, in the long run, adds up to economic growth driving force of the market. An entrepreneur is actually making decisions about what to do. An entrepreneur is engaged in a market process, in a process of price discovery in the pursuit of profit. When an entrepreneur captures profit, what should that signify to us, to the rest of us? I want to build a separate model real quick here. Not in your textbook. I want us to think about this. Suppose we're living in a world where everything is in a steady state. Everything is flowing along, humming along peacefully. Everybody goes to work, produces what they produce, comes to the market, sells it, buys the things that they need, and pretty much everybody goes and does the same amount of work every day and has the same amount of consumption every day and everything is moving along the same way. Everybody gets the same regular income and everything costs the same price. There's the same amount of money in the economy as there ever was. What happens when an entrepreneur comes along and shakes things up? Shakes things up in a way that actually increases productivity. In the same amount of time, with the same amount of resources as inputs, they're able to actually generate more or better outputs than their competitors. How does that affect the world that we live in? In the short run, that entrepreneur is going to capture profits. But everybody had the same amount of money last week as they had had the week before, including all of the firms who employed all of the factors of production. But now one firm, one entrepreneur, is doing better than everyone else. That means 
means that that firm is going to have higher profits than everyone else. Since there's the same amount of money in the world as before, what must that mean about all the other firms? They have less. They have, all the other firms have less revenue than they would have had before. But there's actually more stuff in the world than there was before. So what must that mean about everybody's quality of life? It's better. So you've got more goods and services available in the marketplace with the same amount of money as before. What must that mean? That prices of all goods and services have fallen. This guy who is improving the quality or the availability of whatever good or service it is that they provide and increase the wealth of the world, they're going to be the most well-off in the world. This particular entrepreneur is going to be the most well-off in the world. But is that entrepreneur going to capture the entire surplus, the additional new, the, the whole of the additional new benefit that they've created in the world? Not at all. That entrepreneur will be capturing a great deal of surplus and calling it profit. But in the meantime, all of the consumers who choose to buy from that entrepreneur are also better off. They also have captured a surplus. So, so then, everybody else will be paying less for all of the things that they have been buying before. And once this reaches a new equilibrium, a new steady state, other firms will have imitated the, the entrepreneur who succeeded. And we'll be back to everybody doing the same thing every day again until the next new idea arrives. It is because there is constant competition in the marketplace amongst firms to satisfy their customers that there is this constant change and churn in the economy. And, and Schumpeter called this creative destruction. The fact of creative destruction is what makes it extremely difficult to create a long run plan that has everything moving around, along at this constant rate everywhere in the economy. It makes it more difficult for there to be just one simple constant flow of goods and services and money throughout the economy. It means that there's constantly churn and change. With that constant churn and change, it makes it difficult to create a plan or to know exactly how much to tax this service or what quantity of that service to have throughout the economy. It makes it more difficult. It frustrates the intentions of those who would intervene in the marketplace. It, it frustrates their plans. Okay. But for now... We're going to leave the entrepreneur out, and actually we're going to leave land out also. We're going to just consider a world where there is only capital and labor involved in the production process. Just to simplify things so that we can get an idea of how things are interrelated, we want to understand causal relations clearly. So we're going to say that the total output of our world is a function of capital and labor. That is functional notation, right? I haven't yet expressed a specific algebraic relationship yet. I've just provided a functional notation of it. You can think about this as being the highest point in the world along a production possibility frontier. The best mix of capital and labor such that output is as far out as it can get. Notice what's happening here. We've got the right mix of capital and labor, such that all capital and all labor is as fully employed as it can be. We're maximizing the use of capital and labor. So what we can do is we can put a bar over K and L to signify that we're using all of it. We're using all the available capital and all available labor in the world. Now we can take this loose functional form 
and give it a specific, a specific algebraic expression. We can say the total output is equal to the level of technology in our world the amount of capital in the world and the effectiveness of that capital and the amount of labor in the world and the effectiveness of that labor and what we're going to do with this expression as I said last time because we have alpha and 1 minus alpha, what's alpha plus 1 minus alpha? 1. That's all the resources in the world. Or, looking at it from the flip side, that is all the income in the world. So all of the income in the world, the income is equal to the expenditure, gets divided between the owners of capital and the owners of labor. So alpha is the payment to capital, and 1 minus alpha is the payment to labor. And then all of what is earned, all of what is created in the world, gets distributed between those who hold capital and those who hold labor. A change in A improves or decreases the total level, level of technology in the world, such that our production possibility frontier increases or collapses. We don't usually see a, a collapse in A. We usually just see continuing expansions of improvements in technology, but not always. The world has seen times where societies with very high levels of technology collapsed and then that technology was lost for a long time. Technology is know-how. We've also often lost the know-how to do certain things. A terrible war, a terrible plague, you can wipe out a civilization and take with it all of the knowledge that that society has. Now, if they've written stuff down, so much less knowledge is lost. But how much of what you actually know how to do have you written down? How much of you know what to do do you even know how to express or articulate? A lot of what each of us holds as human capital is tacitly held. What I mean by tacit is knowledge that you know that you don't know that you know, but that you rely on every day. A tacitly held understanding of something is not expressly articulated and is not easily transferable except by walking alongside somebody. The next step that we frequently take whenever we draw some sort of algebraic expression in economics is to take the derivative of it. Why do we do that? Why do we take the derivative of a function? If you've ever been given any kind of a function, why would you take the derivative? To find the rate of change in that in that variable, in the variable of, uh, that you take the derivative with respect to. And the rate of change in economics is what is happening at the margin. We're always interested in what's happening at the margin. Why? Because we're always aiming for the point where the marginal benefit of some activity is equal to the marginal cost of that activity. So long as marginal benefit of a particular activity is greater than the marginal cost of that activity, we will do more of it. If the marginal cost of a particular activity is greater than the marginal benefit of it, it seems obvious that we should do less of that activity. Right? I know a friend who got married a few years ago. And inside their rings, both of them got engraved. The marginal benefit of getting married appeared to each of them to be greater than the marginal cost of getting married. So why aren't they polygamists? I'll have to ask him next time I see him. The first time I thought of that. Okay. In particular, we're interested, at least at first, and understanding what the marginal product of capital is. We're going to investigate capital initially. 
marginal product of capital. So we'll take the first derivative of this function with respect to capital D Y D K. And your textbook uses one plus in order to indicate that we're dealing with the margin. Although if you read the footnotes, you see the calculus. I'm going to go ahead and show you the calculus element of it. Right. If you're not persuaded about the calculus, go to a tutor and ask about it, or just take me at my word. To take the first derivative of this function with respect to alpha, with respect to k, we bring the alpha down. We're left with a times k to the one minus alpha, l to the one minus alpha, and I did this last time as well. If you want to go watch the other video? Actually, this should be alpha minus one. My mistake. Now, this is alpha minus one, and that's one minus alpha. Remember that if we have x to the one, that's equal to x over one, or just equal to x. If we have x to the negative one, that's equal to one over x. Remember this from studying basic exponents. Well, then if I have cal k to the alpha minus 1, and I multiply this by negative 1, I get k to the 1 minus alpha. So then k to the alpha minus 1 is equal to 1 over k to the 1 minus alpha. What is he doing and why? I always wonder. And then this is equal to the marginal product of capital. And I can re-express this as alpha times A times L over K all to the 1 minus alpha. Because you see I have L to the 1 minus alpha and I've got K in the denominator to the 1 minus alpha. So I can just put L over that. Anybody confused about the algebra? Often, people just walk through this much more quickly. I'm happy to go step by step. What does this mean? The next thing we always want to do with this sort of thing is to think about, well, what if one of the variables increases? How does that affect the overall outcome? For example, if capital increases, how does that affect the marginal productivity of capital? Since capital is in the denominator, as the denominator gets bigger, how is this affected? This gets smaller. As capital increases, the marginal productivity of capital decreases. Does that sound right to you? Is there an economic term for this? The iron law of diminishing marginal everything. The iron law of diminishing marginal returns, the, the iron law of diminishing marginal value. So if we put output here and capital here, the initial units of capital will bring great value. But then every additional unit of capital, if I drew the slope of that, and then drew the slope of this, every additional unit of capital brings less total additional productivity. If we smooth it out, it looks like this. The first derivative, the marginal productivity of capital, is equal to the line that is tangent to this curve at any given point. Whatever level of capital we identify, this describes our marginal level of productivity. Now, you see the solo model in intro macro. This is sort of like that, right? This is basically the same picture that we saw in the solo model. And what we've done is we've incorporated this concept of diminishing marginal returns. We're going to assume that this function is 
always increasing, just increasing at a slower and slower rate. So we're not going to assume that it goes negative ever. Keeps going up and up and up and up and up, just slower and slower and slower and slower. That asymptotically approaches some value, which is something that economists like to say because we get to use the word asymptotic. Questions so far? <clears throat> Let's uh, provide some definitions. So part of what we're doing here is just becoming familiar with the different variables that we're going to be using from now through the rest of the semester so that notation becomes more smooth, so that we get less hung up on like, what does that actually mean. So, for example, we can call W wages or the return to labor. We can call R rent or the return or interest or the return to capital. So we can say that P is the price of output. By the way, what are we making? What is our output in this model so far? We're making Y. What is Y? It's everything. It's all of the stuff. It's GDP. What we're describing here is sort of like a GDP factory. What are we making? More GDP. Okay. It's kind of silly, but it's an oversimplification. So this is the price of output, which is related to an, an overall price level, an aggregate price level. So if I wanted to talk about the real return to labor, controlling for the price of output, I would describe it as W divided by P. What happens if prices go up? If prices go up and wages stay the same, then your real wage goes down. If prices go down and your wage stays the same, then your real wage goes up. So I have to include the price of GDP in the denominator here in order to get a definition of the real wage. Now it's similarly want to have R over P to describe the real rental rate. You guys have been thinking a little bit about nominal versus real in terms of GDP. What we're actually interested in is stuff, the real economy. We're, we're, we're going to put the nominal versus real thing to the side and just try to focus on the real economy. Now I made an assumption at this point I assumed that each factor existed in a fixed quantity. That the, that the quantity of each of these inputs into production is at a fixed amount. Well, in the world where we're talking about the provision of goods and services, so long as technology is also being held constant, then what that means is our supply curve for stuff, for GDP, is perfectly inelastic. In other words, we're able to make a certain amount of stuff given the quantity of capital and labor that we currently have, so we're stuck on the same production possibility from here. It's not moving, and that is the supply of stuff that we have in the world. Whatever comes out of what can be produced by that fixed quantity of capital and labor. We're assuming that tech isn't changing. Over here, I'm going to put R over P to signify the return to capital. And here I'm going to put capital. The amount of capital is fixed. So I'm going to focus just on capital for the time being. 
Why do we believe any of this? Again, each individual firm, the entrepreneur representing the firm in a way, is always looking for the way to earn maximum profits. So it will always be choosing capital and labor such that it can maximize those profits. What is total revenue? I'm sorry, what are, what are profits? Profits are typically equal to total revenue minus total costs. Remember that from micro? Okay, so profit, I wanna, I wanna do this over here, I need more room. Profit is equal to total revenues minus total costs. So I'm bringing an IDP in from micro. What are the revenues to each firm from what I've done so far? Revenue is equal to price times quantity. Does that sound familiar? So we have an overall price level. And what quantity gets made? The quantity is equal to this function of capital and labor. This is our output. What are the costs to the firm? Well, the firm has to pay for capital and the firm has to pay for labor. It has to pay R times capital. So this is the rate that we pay capital, and this is the amount of capital that the firm hires. And the firm also has to pay wages to every laborer that it hires. So this is total revenue, this is total cost, this is profit. To get to a point where we can develop the next step, what we want to do is divide everything by price. So we divide both sides of the equation by price, and we're left with profit divided by price is equal to the production function minus the rate of rental rate of capital divided by price times capital minus the cost of labor per unit of labor times the number of units of labor. Notice this is real, the real price of capital. This is the real price of labor. And this is the real profit rate. This is the rate of profit. At this point, I'm going to throw back in this particular functional form for output. Just repeating what I've done here, bringing it down. In a way, what we've done is we've realized, made it real, this economy. And now we're going to say, well, we want to maximize profits. We want to maximize real profits. What do we do here? Took the first derivative. What are we going to do now? Take the first derivative again. We want to maximize. productivity of capital and labor. So we can take the first derivative here, and um, I'm going to focus on capital. You can do it for labor on your own if you're interested. <clears throat> so then the first order condition here will be that taking the first derivative we get, well, instead of taking the derivative of this again, which is this, we can say that the result is the marginal product of capital. 
first derivative of this would be the marginal product of capital. The first derivative of this chunk with respect to capital will simply be the raised weight minus price. And then this goes to zero because it's a constant. How can I interpret this? Well, when it's maximized, this is equal to zero. And so then I can say that the marginal product of capital is equal to the rate over the price. And I can bring that back over to this graph here. What I can say is that if I hold R constant, and increase P, the marginal product of capital will go down. If I hold, if as, as R varies, the higher interest rate, the higher payment to capital. The lower the interest rate, the lower the payment to capital. So as R goes up, the payment to capital goes up, as R goes down, the payment of capital goes down. And what we arrive at here is the maximized rate or the equilibrium where the firm would want to hire capital. Notice, if the interest rate falls, the firm will hire more capital and generate more output. In the real world, what that means is if the interest rate falls, entrepreneurs take on projects <clears throat> that have a lower rate of return and are still able to realize a profit. Suppose you have an idea for a new project and you think the rate of return on this project is going to be 5%. If the rental rate of capital is 7%, you're not going to do it. You're not going to earn any profits. You're going to be paying more to higher capital than what your rate of return will be on whatever your idea is. If the interest rate falls to 2%, the cost of renting capital falls to 2%, then you're going to hire more capital. You're actually going to take on that project that you otherwise would not have taken on. Are you with me? This becomes important later on because the interest rate can be a sort of illusion, especially when the interest rate has been manipulated. What we most are interested in is the real interest rate. At least an investor would be most interested in that. If an investor has a hard time ascertaining what the real interest rate is in the world, what the real cost of capital is, what the real rate of return is going to be on their project, they get skittish and scared, and they withdraw from the market. When they withdraw from the market, development of new capital, and not really included right now, but technology falters, and the rate of economic growth slows down. All this builds towards uh, something called the Austrian business cycle. Through all of this, we've made an assumption called the constant returns, the scale assumption. There's a, some discussion in your textbook about constant returns to scale. It's a mathematical assumption that helps all of this to work. When constant returns to scale are not held, things get a little fuzzy. But to simplify things, to make the model straightforward so we at least can just start to become familiar with these variables and how they're interacting we make this assumption to, to simplify matters so if if first of all so that's one assumption we're making the second assumption that we're making is that this cobb douglas production function is actually descriptive of the world that we live in and it's been tried and tested several times, and it's pretty close. It's not perfect, but it's pretty close. 
typically in the real world the input the, the the income generated by some productive activity typically does get divided mostly between capital and labor which is to say that the entrepreneur actually gets just a smidgen how much of a smidgen somewhere between two and three percent is what's been estimated what does that mean for us in the real world it means that in the basic simplified economy, when you buy a thing, what are we buying? We're buying a thing. That the seller's willingness to sell price is very different from the buyer's willingness to pay price. And the majority of the surplus accrues to the consumer. And very little of the surplus accrues to the producer. The world is made wealthy and better off because entrepreneurs are constantly finding new ways to satisfy the customers. And yet, as soon as a new idea gets created in the world, it gets imitated, which whittles away at the producer's capacity to earn surpluses. And more and more of the surpluses accrue to the consumer percent is the surplus that the producer actually captures. The rest goes out. Where does it go out to? Well, consumers capture their surpluses, and the rest of it gets paid to capital and labor. Land as well a little bit, but we're setting that aside for now. Now, suppose that we treat the owners of capital as those horrible capitalists. Those wicked, evil capitalists. They just own stock and don't work. And they call this money. Well, the, the empirical research seems to show that capital captures about 30% of the payment from production, and labor captures about 70% of the payment from production. Ask any manager of a small firm, what is your greatest cost? What is the most expensive thing about running your company? And it's payroll. Almost always it's payroll. Remember you have to include in payroll total compensation, not just employees take home pay, but also all the benefits. That is also a cost related to labor, not to capital. Again, we're also making one farther assumption here that markets are perfectly competitive, that there's no monopolies engaging here. That monopolies aren't muddying the waters in our analysis. So then, because there's a perfectly competitive world, in a perfectly competitive world, what happens? In a perfectly competitive world, from the producer's side, they take demand as given. From in a perfectly competitive world, they take Supply as given, and both are perfectly elastic. In other words, the price is what it is, and it doesn't change. There's no competition such that prices have to be yet discovered. They've already been discovered, and they're remaining the same. That's why I sort of told the story about the world that's evenly rotating and not changing at all. We assume that prices are what they are, and they're not changing. So firms take prices as given. That is, the firm can't influence the price. So the firm is going to hire labor if the cost, the wage rate, is lower than the benefit, which is the marginal productivity of labor. I've done the analysis here for capital, but similarly, we want the marginal productivity of labor be related to the real wage rate. Once the firms, once, once the market is perfectly competitive, the marginal productivity of labor will be equal to the wage rate. So we'll have a similar graph, but with labor instead of capital involved. Questions?
Are you absorbing it or are you just trying to like get it down and then think about it later? I understand that that's the case, right? If we have constant returns to capital, then our total level of output is going to be equal to the marginal productivity of capital times the amount of capital that we use. Every unit of capital produces a certain amount of output, and at this particular level of capital, it's producing this marginal productivity of capital. So this times this is how much output comes from capital. And then we'll add to that the marginal productivity of labor times whatever amount of labor we're using. This would further mean that, as I was describing here, the income to capital The marginal productivity of capital times the amount of capital times the amount of capital is equal to capital's share of income times the total amount of income in the world. Similarly, the marginal productivity of labor times the amount of labor in the world is equal to one minus alpha times the total amount of output in the world. 